Well, hello there, folks. I'm Pruitt. And this is Jim Davis. Hey. And today we're going to talk about adding tools to your role-playing game to make the stories better. With Grant Ellis. Wait, where's Grant? Where'd he go? Let's talk to Grant on WebDM. This episode is sponsored by 2C Gaming with Grimworld, a new supplement for 5th edition. Grimworld is a land of perilous journeys and dark fairy tales. Lead designer and our friend Grant Ellis has penned revolutionary storytelling tools that encourage narrative-focused collaboration between DMs and players, rules that support your tales of exploration, war, intrigue, and romance. He's even completely overhauled the character creation system to let you select traits and customize your character more than ever before. We love everything that 2C does. We've written for them, and we stand behind their and Grant's work 100%. We can't wait for this book. Link in the comments and description. Grant Ellis, what are you doing here? Hey. Well, I've come <laughs> to collect your souls and your taxes. No, my friends, I'm here to talk about story and play and role-playing games, and I'm happy to do it with my friends. And and we love having you here. Um, you're, you're, you're coming out with a, with a game of your own. So why don't you give us a brief run through of, of who you are, just besides, you know, playing on my game and Jim's game and running our Twitch and uh, just being an all-around swell guy. So I'm an independent content creator for tabletop role-playing games. I'm the Twitch producer on WebDM's Twitch channel. I've guested on the podcast a few times. I'm a uh, designer of games. I'm a Gold Any winner in 2019. And I'm kickstarting a game coming up, which is all about dark fairy tales in 5th edition fantasy role-playing. When you're designing... What are you leaning towards? Is it the, the role playing or is it mechanics? Like how do you come at designing something like this? So the first approach I take is I think about what problem am I solving for? Mm -hmm. And one of the problems I'm solving for is how do you take a rules framework and solve different story types? For example, there might be war stories, there might be mysteries, there might be heartwarming tales of romance, there might be stories about going on long travels. Mm -hmm. Political and intrigue. Political intrigue, uh, broken hearts, mm -hmm. uh, patching families back together, as well as monster hunting and going deep into dungeons. Sure. I figure each of those things kind of fit in different boxes. So can I create mechanical subsystems? Which is a technical way of saying, when do we roll dice? Right. When do we tick clocks? When do we pass cards, etc.? Yeah. And apply that to a tabletop role-playing game. For my game, we're taking the core of 5th edition and then we're adding some of these subsystems to it. Yeah. So you're creating like things to support uh, styles of play or goals for play that are currently, they don't really have a lot of mechanical support, just like advice and hand wave it. Seems like. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So what I'm trying to do is move away some of the DM fiat, some yeah, of the yeah. some of the hand wavium, and actually give some codified procedures to game masters. And again, that's a technical way of saying knowing when to roll <laughs> dice, knowing when to hand out inspiration, things like that. Sure. Giving sort of if-then statements. If the players do this, then do that. I think a good way to look at it too is also I don't want to just provide the game master with tools, I want to provide the players with tools. Right. Yeah. Um, my game takes place in a fairy tale setting, and I want it to be all about whimsy, fantastical characters, etc. Yeah. I kind of wanted to move away from uh, what I'd call fit traditional fantasy races, dwarves, elves, etc. Mm -hmm. And empower the characters to kind of explore self-exploration, almost like the Jim Henson Creature Workshop. I'm going to take a character, I'm gonna describe their body type, I'm gonna describe their eyes, the quality of their voice, I'm gonna describe the way they kind of move about the scene, how they're dressed, mm -hmm. what kind of vibe do they project to the world, as well as identifying you know, cultural heritages and things like that, what do they do before their adventure. Yeah. All the mechanics of the original game are there, but I've also added on these additional layers, really it's so you can do the self-exploration, really piece the kind of character that you wanna be. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna be a, a swashbuckling frog knight with a voice like honey, you know. You can be him, you can be Salvatore the frog knight. Yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. you kind of create your own character races, create your own backgrounds, uh, but keeping it simple, fast, pithy, and let the players really enjoy that process. Yeah. Well, no, it, it seems to me um, when, you're, when you're kind of giving a framework for those descriptions that would lend itself to be people being uh, more engaged because the, you might actually hit uh, a particular quirk or whatever that somebody else goes, oh, that's cool, that's, the, that's what I do. Yeah. Are you just an observer of people? Like, how do you how come to that? Like, is it just the things that, that pop whenever you're like in the world or when you're gaming? As far as design goes, what I did is, uh, 
a lot of research. Mm -hmm. You know, what are a hundred different ways to describe someone's personality? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and <laughs> go through a lot of books and then start, try, try to pick out uh, touchstones. Right. Try to find these things that really resonate with people as well as have variety because it's very easy to do a stack of positive traits. Uh, I have uh, dark hair, I wear glasses, I wear camo uh, death save shirts, uh, <laughs> got nice manicured facial hair, um, yeah. good at teaching the uh, Taekwondo, and you know, Jonathan Pruitt. Uh, but also, you know, you want to find that balance. You know, you also want to give the uh, uh, portly boy from Virginia with, you know, uh, high cheekbones and a round face like a pie plate and uh, scraggly blonde hair. Yeah, but you need to copyright those cheekbones. <laughs> you study people, but you also do a lot of research. Uh, as well as uh, providing that vast variety. So we want to make sure you cover all sorts of body types. You know, we play with a mutual friend, TK Johnson, and they wanted to play a character that was very large. So they played a Gila monster inspired lizard folk in the land between two rivers. Yeah. What my framework does is it helps people that maybe aren't as descriptive. Like, I'll be honest, when I uh, run a game, uh, I might not be the most descriptive. But it tells players these really evocative words to describe their character. Likewise, provide the mechanics to the game. Choosing your uh, feats, so to be, or I, I should say features, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you're describing this kind of character who might be of uh, a fairy folk descent, you want to make sure that maybe they have magic, mm -hmm. or maybe they can teleport, or maybe they have wings. So you kind of choose from a menu two out of maybe 12 options. It's like, I want wings, and I also want this sort of glamour weave ability where I get to pick uh, either druid or sorcerer, a first level spell, and two cantrips. Mm -hmm. And you kind of build your character. So that's kind of where we start from the player side, where you kind of weave your own mythology at the table. I kind of like that because like fifth edition does have that sort of style of, of this is as much about character interactions as it is about the adventure, that, that they're really trying to like get you to invest in your character. I, I see like the b personality traits, beliefs, ideals, flaws as a step in that direction. But it seems like you're taking it and, and putting more of the control in the player's hands, saying like you can really invest in what your character projects out there, and then like supporting that with and then the interfaces with these subsystems you're talking about, you know? Yeah, so 100 percent, and I think it's really important that you uh, mention those background details, like the personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws, uh, because in my game system, when you interface with those aspects of your character, mm -hmm. the system notifies the game master when they engage with their bond while interacting with, say, an enemy, here's uh, some options you can add to the enemy. Maybe you make them an elite enemy. Mm. Maybe they're gonna do double damage than the typical enemy in the system. Mm. Likewise, you know, maybe uh, they have the ability to summon a swarm, but it lets you know as your character is engaged with the role-playing, mm -hmm. uh, and when I say role-playing, I'm referring to the mechanics associated with the game itself, not just uh, playing, character. portraying characters, yeah. talking in character. It's as they touch these aspects of their characters, there's a reason it's on their character sheet. Mm -hmm. I think that's really the best way to learn a, a, a role-playing game. Your character sheet's kind of your interface mm -hmm. with the game. Uh, a lot of times when I teach systems, I, I feel a system is successful if I touch every spot of the character sheet, almost like a game of operation, you know, mm -hmm. removing the bones. <laughs> it's like, Funny bone. yeah, yeah, but that's that's sort of the way it, it works for me. In terms of like creating a, a character that has these uh, mechanical hooks for them, and then like uh, having systems that support it, is this something that you're doing to like drive play to help DM sort of uh, set up the world or, or a specific adventure, or is it more there for like the players to get invested like, where's the interaction, I guess, between DM and player and getting that in, uh, investment that you're trying to encourage? I think it's twofold. You want the game master to clearly articulate the structure of the game we're playing. Everyone, we're playing a mystery. We're mm -hmm. gonna solve a mystery together. I need everyone to buy into this. In turn, I need you to take actions that help solve the mystery. You're gonna know the type of actions maybe you should take by looking at those background details. And then the game's going to reward you for participating in those actions. If you uh, try to solve the mystery, then the game will reward you. Yeah. You might not solve the mystery, but you'll have a pretty good time attempting to. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're at least 
trying. Um, and so, do or do so not. Do, do, uh, there, is, <laughs> there is no try. A couple of questions. Uh, first off, is this just going to be only for 5e, or can you use this in other systems? I believe with a, a really good setting when you're designing settings could be used with other systems. I'd like to have some stretch goals to expand to other uh, core rule sets, such as Cypher System or Powered by the Apocalypse. Uh, we're working out those details. Mm -hmm. but I think a really good setting when you design, I think it's a Wolfgang Bauer quote, is um, don't just think about world building, think about setting design, and a good setting should stand on its own for any system. Mm -hmm. I think I've run several dozen settings in you know, an equal number of rule sets just because I choose the rules for the type of game that I want to play. What I'm hearing is there's a lot of uh, taking those elements that right now just sort of rely on whenever the DM decides it's going to happen or a simple die roll, the universal yeah. kind of like, all right, roll your d20, add your proficiency kind of thing, and trying to complicate that, offer the players more choices and more ways to interface, and hopefully like that creates an environment where there's richer interaction with the game world and like mm -hmm. spurs everything. Can you give us like some concrete examples of what that might look like? Like so, something taking it out of the DM's hands and putting it in a procedure. Okay, so taking something out of the DM's hands is the awardance of inspiration. Oh, God, yeah. You know, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> for when people actually remember to reward. It might say, for when you run a combat scenario, mm -hmm. we're going to run combat. This is a story about uh, monster hunting and delving into dungeons that are dark and deep. You're going to go into the deep places of the earth. Mm -hmm. And then we will list five instances during this adventure structure where you would reward inspiration. Mm -hmm. When a player is willing to go into a location where they have no chance of seeing anything, and it's colder than any place they've ever been, mm -hmm. and someone takes that leap of faith into the game world, award a point of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Give them that mechanical incentive. Likewise, when they're outnumbered and they're against all odds, the player that stamps their ground and calls the others to either flee for their lives while they hold, uh, while they delay the inevitable, mm. or uh, leads the counter assault, mm. award inspiration to someone for being a heroic leader. You know, a third example uh, would be when someone steps in to defend. Maybe not awarding inspiration, but maybe saying in these situations where a player stands up for another player character, mm -hmm. give them a bonus to their armor class. Give them a conditional modifier. We have conditional modifiers. It's like, well, uh, they're acting valiant. Uh, reward it and incentivize it in the game. Likewise, uh, it also in, uh, empowers the game master if uh, players are not interacting with the game. They're sandbagging the adventure. Mm -hmm. They're bringing everyone else down. Maybe dole out a penalty. It's kind of like, Hey, just so you know, the uh, the game world's not too happy with you right now. Right. And full disclosure, there is a game master controlled character, kind of like the rooster from Disney's Robin Hood, that kind of goes in and out of the story. <laughs> or John, Hurt, yeah, or John Hurt from Disney uh, or Jim Henson's Storyteller. You yeah. know, he's sometimes he's there, sometimes he's not. It's like you know what? Or, or Q from Star Trek. You sure, know, it's just, Q. I was, you're just not there. Right I'm going to change the rules of the universe for you um, because you have the opportunity to tell great stories. Yeah. I, as a Game Master character, they are, they're the storyteller, they're the narrator, the narrador. Mm -hmm. um, they live off of stories, and when someone just kind of sandbags, really they probably wouldn't even have a name in the book, you know, they'd be out of focus in the background. We yeah. want to encourage people to uh, be the stars of their story, be the main character. So this sort of GMPC is not like, it's not like the D&D, the DM from uh, the D&D cartoon, right? Like a physical NPC. No, it's up. like that, yeah. Okay, then it is then. I, for a minute it sounded like it's more the, the DM NPC is like a force in the world that kind of acts against it, but I also like them being a person that I can talk to. <laughs> it's, it's both. So uh, there are, there's their influence throughout the world, and we have, you know, tables in the game. It's like, you know, roll, roll the die, you know. If you hear the howl of a wolf, you know that Rustum Crimson Snow is influencing the story. Mm -hmm. And you, you have these little cues, these little uh, sensory perceptions. You know, you hear something, you smell something, you see something. The clues you in, the, the narrator, the GM-controlled character is influencing the game. Or they just might show up. Because I can hear it now. There's a lot of people at GMPC. It's overpowered. You're, you're like, you know, you're inserting yourself into the game. Like, players' agency is going to be taken away. Anything you have to like alleviate some of like concerns for that? Because I really like this idea. I love the idea of being a force in the setting. Well, it seems like if you handle it right, it's a very nuanced way to, to have a corrective measure in place that you're 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 taking the guesswork out mm, sure. of of how to how to correct these behaviors. Check out our episode on problem play behaviors. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but how, how nuanced are the mechanics for that? Let's look at the framework. You already have a, uh, a dungeon master, a game master, running the game, mm. who already is omnipotent and already has no scope. Sure. Right. This actually reduces that scope. Right. It, it, rather than do anything on your own whim, you're, you're giving clear set instructions. Yeah. And these are instructions that players can learn from. You actually want to encourage player agency, and you want to be a fan of the players. You want them to make creative uh, choices. And what you're doing is you're helping them understand from the palette of infinite choices, reducing back some of that and affording them uh, very clear-cut options. Yeah. Choose you know, good, better, or best. You'll get rewarded for all of them, but also choose the one that your character would choose. Right, right. Uh, likewise, you know, it is kind of a, a pushback to have a, a meta character in the world, yeah. uh, but also it clearly lets the players know when they're either crossing lines or when they should push those lines. Maybe yeah. they should break those boundaries. Maybe that's what the game master character wants. Maybe he really wants them to take control of their own destinies and forge their own path. Uh, and what it does is it simply incentivizes and codifies player rewards. Mm -hmm. So, And uh, if you're playing the Grand Ellis drinking game where every time he says the word codifies, you take a shot, there's probably about nine or so shots into this episode. Yeah, essentially what we want to do is we want to give structure, we want to give clear-cut rules, while still letting players know Sometimes you're just gonna have to use your best judgment. So you say like clear cut rules, structures, for a lot of players out there in a lot of tables and, and myself included, we're looking at role playing and that interaction and, and like why players make certain choices. And a lot of that's just internal. We don't, it's not interfaced with the game rules at all. And it, it seems to kind of work. Players seem to find goals that they want to pursue. There's investment in the world. So like what's the benefit of having something that's clear cut, structured, as opposed to the more freeform style that I think a lot of uh, tables are used to. Well, the first thing I would say that it allows you to frame your scenes in your game. Yeah. You'll know when a scene has a beginning, middle, and an end. Yeah. Likewise, it'll empower you to be a more precise storyteller. When you're making decisions about what to include in your game, the system will help you figure out what to cut out. That is to say, you don't want to remove the f uh, improvisational fun. Mm -hmm. You still want to empower the uh, improvisational tool by restricting it slightly yeah. as well as uh, giving uh, more toys to play with at the table. Yeah. I think any table that's having a lot of fun playing RPGs already, what this might do is just prompt additional ideas. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was going to say, good improv still needs prompts. You still you have, the, right. you have the touchstones to start from and then you, you let your mind blossom from there. Right? Game structures for me, particularly when it comes to like adjudicating social interactions or just how the world works around the uh, the players is like it's helpful when they're dm facing so like an example of this for me would be like i prefer something that lets me roll a reaction to an npc as opposed to something a player rolls like a persuasion or a charm or something like that i like tell me what you got to say whether it's in person third person whatever but uh or in character or out of character usually i'll be the one to inter interface with the uh the rules Are, is that sort of similar with this Are the players interfacing with a lot of new rules th themselves i wouldn't necessarily say they're interfacing with new rules uh but what they might do is they might approach the rules differently mm -hmm. for example this seeks to solve the problems about when and how to award experience sure you will know very clearly when you level in the system because you're playing through a story, similar yeah. to games like uh, Invisible Sun by Monty Cook Games, right. where you are traveling through an arc. And as you travel through the arc together, you're building a story together. Yeah. And as you progress through this as a group of players, you're gonna gain experience, you're gonna gain levels, you're gonna unlock new abilities. And it uh, sort of removes what I'll call the old, uh, the old black belt method from uh, my jujitsu training. <laughs> you get the belt advancement, when I feel that you have earned it. Right. That was the sort of the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It's, yeah. I, when I know you've earned it, that's when I'm gonna give it to you. There was no testing system, it was a lot of fiat. It, yeah, yeah. You find some of that in sort of what I'll call loose milestones in fifth yes. edition. Oh, yeah. So this, this really just clues you in. And so if you're uh, lacking confidence in maybe when and how to make a decision that says, if your players have done this, 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 and this, yeah. you know, they've qualified themselves on four different levels, now advance them. Yeah. And if they haven't, you have a game master character to prompt them in a direction to push towards either a conclusion of the narrative or to explore a story beat that has been left. Yeah. And you can still give them options rather than restrict them and railroad them. You might say, you know, there are four villages you have not yet visited on this trail. Yeah. Each of them would love to meet your characters. Right. Choose one. Choose one, yeah. And if they say camp here, 
I'll just bring on some monsters and have a big old fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll play some TV. I, I, but I really, I really like that because it's a way of like codifying things. I, I find that when I rely on fiat, I get in ruts. And I, that's when my unconscious bias kicks in. And that's when I find myself like thinking about my games after the fact and going like, man, I, I, in hindsight, I would have made a different decision or would have you know, adjudicated that differently or something. And so like the game structures give you a way to kind of bypass a lot of that, uh, the downfalls of, of DM Fiat. And I find from a player side, it gives me a sense of the game world as an independent place that's not just, did the DM eat lunch this, this week? <laughs> you know, are they just yeah. cranky or hangry <laughs> or something? <laughs> and like, that's why they're saying no. If you've not played with them, and in a lot of uh, modern games, the, these sort of game structures are less prevalent than they were in uh, earlier uh, games. It can seem weird, it can seem artificial, or seem like you're getting in the way of a kind of naturalistic improv style, and I find them very empowering. I find them very mm -hmm. like, we're going to give you the tools to have a more satisfying game experience. Oh, know? I, I totally agree, and, and Grant, you can back me up here. When, we were running, when you were running Invisible Sun on our channel, mm. and I first had my character, I had too expansive of an arc from the beginning and I didn't know what to do because I didn't understand. It's like, no, 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 incremental steps. Don't don't make your arc the big final <laughs> thing. You Okay, I need to gather these materials. I need to prep these materials. I need to, you know, those are your arcs. Mm -hmm. And like once it that happened, it was a completely different experience, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'm just backing you up there on the empowering part. Sure, sure. No, you definitely know. And it's one of those things too. It's a framework that provides, you know, you're going to have that C plot. It's there's the final uh, event that we're working to, the climax, followed by the denouement. But I'm going to have my personal individual arc, as well as we're going to have some goals as a team and a, a group of adventurers that are going on stories here in this sort of, it's a dark fairy tale world. If you're into things like Jim Henson's Dark Crystal or the Storyteller, Labyrinth, you know, it kind of has that curious girl in a magical world, you know, yeah. feel. Yeah. I, I like, love that idea because so many fairy tales or good stories are that lost adventure in a strange new land. Yeah. Like you can you can make that broad assumption about a lot of stories. And because, you know, that's kind of how everybody feels. You know, it's <laughs> literally like when you're having new experiences, you feel lost. And feel like lost, this right. gives you a like kind of a framework on trying that out and being used to those feelings uh, so that it kind of help you in life because not to get all whatever about it, but I think that's one reason why we play these role-playing oh, games. Yeah. So like we, we were talking about Invisible Sun a minute ago and, and we've got these, uh, sh Invisible Sun has these structures where, like it's the first game I saw where the method of advancement was put in the player's hands for like how they choose, I'm gonna buy an arc which will generate XP for me and it will give me a benchmarks that I need to hit. How I hit those benchmarks, what they look like, is all up to me and, and the referee is gonna like find a way to craft a satisfying encounter out of that and everything. But it was, a, I thought it was really interesting because up until that point, I was like, how would you introduce these kind of things without it being railroady, without like having a predetermined end that you're working towards? And in this style, it's just, it gives you an arc. Go discover this thing. Go, uh, you know, establish a, a romance or found an organization or seek revenge or any other number of things you can do and like, Experiencing it as a player, like cemented the idea that giving me an, a mechanical incentive that combines with like the narrative elements of the game is I don't you won't need to provide hooks. I'll I'll, I'll bring my own <laughs> goals and everything. So it's like that's sort of the thing you're trying to capture and and, and get to. Yes, it, really, I think what it is is we interface with these mechanics and we play the game. We have fun at the table. We have this experience of uh, portraying these characters and playing these roles mm -hmm. in uh, the uh, whimsical fantasy setting. Uh, but those mechanics start to uh, create emotions in us and yeah. we start to feel these certain feelings such as accomplishment or guilt because you know maybe maybe I broke someone's heart maybe my character wasn't ready for a romance I had to I had to take off okay. and I had to leave town because the sun was setting and uh, <laughs> my night travels with the rotation of the earth you yes. know he is a wanderer yeah. and uh, I feel those feelings and then I talk with my friends about those feelings and that's where the story comes from that's yeah. where you start telling story so I get to use my creativity as a player uh, and the game provides me with uh, these feelings that I share with other people. And I think that's the big, the big distinction there. Like the story is the retelling of it after the fact. You're experiencing something while it's going on. The game itself is like this experience of play. And then the story comes in 
afterwards, and I think that was like always present with role playing games, and and it was always like a feature of it. But it's you also kind of have to trust, <laughs> and I think there's a lot of difficulty for some people because they want they want something, they want a specific experience, they want a certain type of engagement, yeah, and. I, in my opinion, they sort of put the cart before the horse. Instead of creating the conditions for this, they try to like artificially induce the engagement, the investment. Well, yeah, that, I'm right there with you because I was formulating my question here, which was, you know, those people that create those elaborate backstories for their characters. Oh, sure, yeah. But this is actually giving them an avenue to be like, oh, you have this thing that you want to be. Yeah. Well, now let's bring some arcs in so sure, that yeah. you can actually do that, and it's part of the game, as opposed to sometimes people can see it as like, a distraction from the plot because the the GM has brought oh, sure, in yeah, yeah. their thing yeah and now it can be a plot. thing where you're all coming together and helping each other this advance is, this is true collaborative storytelling because a feature of the game is you have a book a collection of the tales and as you play through an arc together you talk about this is where we journeyed and this is what we did yeah. how did we all feel about that experience and then we write down both our characters and ourselves so at the end of the campaign you as a play, uh, a collection of players have written the story of your campaign together. That's cool. Very powerful. Now that all you got to cool. do is publish, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, got to kickstart first. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. I, I could see that being a really great um, session recap tool. I was sort of like, okay, guys, remember, put yourself in the mindset of last week. Remember where you're, you were personally as a player. Remember where your character was. Let's recap. And I can see it, or even like, you know, you in the middle of the week on a Discord channel, sort of like filling it in, and then you read back over it at the start, and keeping that continuity of like motivations and, and intent uh, is, I mean, it's such a powerful way to build up uh, strong connections between the characters in the world that I'm excited to see sort of the tools that will be available for to support it. And I think we kind of hit on something as well when we talk about the overarching plot or endpoints or a real tight structure. Yeah. I think we notice also with these role-playing games, particularly in the system that I'm developing, uh, that we, we sort of see a technical term, orthogonal loop. Essentially, player creativity going towards a player-specified goal as opposed to a story goal. Mm. So the story has an endpoint. You might, you know, you've probably played Skyrim and you've put hundreds of hours into building the perfect house or having the perfect romance or running a shop. Sure. The game is the best armor. <laughs> yes. So so the by game, 18th level. Yeah. <laughs> the game the game has its uh, story end, yeah. but you can create your own story and you yeah. by setting your own goal and you just find yourself playing the game, uh, creating your own style of play, getting your own enjoyment from it. Systems that give you those tools to create that sort of enjoyment mm -hmm. are very powerful for the players. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. What I like about that, what you're saying, is basically this game that the character's playing, it isn't the book of this character. It's just a chapter in their life. Or it could be a section in their <laughs> life. But it, they get to decide how, how that continues. So I think like in terms of you know, players having goals and, and sort of bringing those goals and intent and, and a drive to the game, any kind of structures that you're providing, like sample scenarios or, or something for people to kind of like plug their own uh, ideas into or something? Or where's your head, head, head at on that one? It's a setting book uh -huh. too. So obviously there's continents, locations, adventure hooks. Uh, since we talked about different types of stories, so if you look at say the village of Fairbrook, uh, Fairbrook has a number of different story types that you can just actively go into. This person's looking for a romance. This person uh, wants to make sure that we repel the invading uh, fell beyonders or nightmare creatures, whatever have you. Uh, but likewise, there might be a location called your cousin's house. Mm -hmm. Talk with the players. One of you has a cousin who lives here. Nice. Yeah. Whose yeah. is it? Yeah. Let's describe your cousin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your cousin is going to have a situation that needs to be resolved. Yeah. Likewise, you, you want to empower the game master as well as the players to create and invent their own scenarios. If someone has a very large family, talk about how you can use those fictional elements in the story. Yeah, yeah. I really like that because like one of my favorite uh, you know, products for uh, just D&D is Yoon Soon, and it has tons of tables for like, here's the social club your characters belong to. This is the patrons at the tea house. And, uh, you know, here's what they, you know, the local magistrate might want you to do in the jungle. It's, and it's like, you can create these elements on the fly, use the preset ones, and my, personally I find those uh, kind of setups very satisfying because you make your own and can tailor it to you know your group, give you the tools you need uh, for that. It also has slug overlords. It also has <laughs> slug overlords, but yeah. There's that. I, I bought the book and read it on your re recommendations. <laughs> what it's sounding like is that there's a, uh, almost like there's a preceded 
sandbox, playground kind of thing of, of you can go here, you're going to need to, here's how you fill in the details for the characters, but like if the players want to do something, you can tell them, oh, well, the, the adventure's out there. These people here, like you were saying, need help. They would love to meet you. They would love to have a hero stop by. And in that sense, it, it provides an incentive to get out there and adventure. Yeah, and you, you also begin every arc with a really strong framework where you let them know, you know, you begin it once upon a time right. or a long time ago or and so it was. And you start the prompt and it always begins, the narrator reveals that they're going to be wearing a certain particular mask. We're going to have a story mm -hmm. of uh, places dark and dim and monsters that need to be slain. And then you sort of give, this is the initial conflict that's going on. Mm -hmm. We need adventures to solve it. And the story begins in a location, maybe in the middle of things or on the way to it, mm -hmm. so that you can resolve the story and start progressing towards an arc. You uh, don't necessarily want players to be wandering aimlessly and a lot of it uh, too might seem like this is strange. I'm not too sure where to go. I'm not too sure what to do. You want to give them a strong seed. Yeah. And these are, you know, fairy tales are some of the oldest stories we have as human beings. They're right. thousands of years old. Every culture has them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think they resonate with a very wide audience of all ages. Mm -hmm. Certainly. It sounds like, you know, they, there are a, uh, a wide variety of ways to engage with it because like some of those fairy tales are you know, it's about outsmarting something, and others it's about, yeah. you know, physical prowess or something. It's the mythic kind of, uh, the coupling of fantastic and mundane and embedding it in a world, coupled with, like, the mechanical support for it that, to me, promises, like, a new way to engage with the 5th edition rule set, because now we're... We're doing more <laughs> with with this basic kind, yeah. of, uh, kind of set. And a fairy tale generally has a lesson to be learned. Oh, sure, right, right. yeah. And so it, I, I assume that's a part of it as well. Yeah, there's a very powerful quote by Neil Gaiman. He attributes it to G.K. Chesterton, and he says, fairy tales are more than true, not because they teach us that dragons exist, but because they teach us that dragons can be beaten. Yeah. And I want my players to feel that they can beat dragons in their own lives. They can uh, play through any sort of story type, mm -hmm. IRL, in real life, and they can get through that. And I want the game to empower them to feel confident in their regular lives. Whether it's a mechanic or whether it's a, like a place in the, in the setting itself or maybe a character, what's your favorite little thing? Like your, what's, your, what's your favorite son or daughter or whatever, so to speak, that you can't wait for players to interact with? Well, first I want every player to go through the character creation process mm -hmm. and to discover their fairy tale character. In mine, who I created, who uh, will, is available as a sample character. You can see exactly how I built them and you can make your own. If you go on our site, there will be a link below. Is Salvatore the Frog Knight. Okay. He is Frogkin. Uh, his people come from the swamp. He has bulging eyes, but he has a very you know, sonorous voice. Um, he is known for being very valiant and courageous. Yeah. Uh, and these are things I picked, but he's, he's stout. He's not very tall, uh, but he moves very well. He is a sword master. He uh, has the ability to summon a familiar that he calls his squire. He can also uh, cast a couple cantrips like animal companionship, etc. Uh -huh. He's and he he has his good squire, and we, he is a wandering knight who speaks in a poetic language. You know, I'm just choosing things from a list, uh, and people look to him as if he'd be a good leader, but he cannot stay for he has a cause to go through and he travels on his uh, trusty mount and he travels with his party wielding his Y-hander, you know, and he's, he's just a very evocative character who I love because when I was thinking about what kind of game do I want to make, I said, I want you to be the Frog Prince. Yeah. I don't want you to have to listen to the story of the Frog Prince. I want to empower you to be that character. Right. Yeah. Going on a noble quest. Just yeah. trying to get some smooches to turn into Just trying to get some smooches. <laughs> and he's proud of his frog heritage. I really like the, the framing device of it, sort of like once upon a time uh, or something. And it, it, to me, it kind of suggests um, bite-sized sort of chunks of a campaign where it's like, we're going we're gonna to tell this discreet story. We don't know how it's going to end. We don't know what's going to happen. But we've got these structures that will shape the game in a certain way and like a framing device for it, because I love sandbox, I love just like, here's a town, and you can go some rumors and get in trouble. But having a strong, like, something that propels the game, something that mm -hmm. gives it, uh, you know, themes to be about. I really like those, because so often, when I've tried to do them or, or experience them from the player's side, it's just kind of like, oh, I want this game to be about X. I want it to be about the tension between whatever, or, or this theme, and then, that's that's it. We don't. There's nothing to reinforce it. There's no mechanics or anything. So I, it's always missed opportunity, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, 
Well, well kind no. of piggybacking on that point, Jim, seeing as how you've kind of merged storytelling and mechanics together, which a lot of people see as maybe like conflicting at the table, like worrying about mechanics versus story, what are some of the pitfalls when trying to design that, you know, to make it pl like playable. Anytime you're in a group dynamic and you give that much narrative control to the entire table, you have to be very careful how you use that. Yeah, herding cats. Yeah. You, herding cats, <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe you don't trust each other, maybe you have conflicting goals. Yeah. I think it's very good, um, the mechanics are the conversation that you end up having with the game. Yeah. And letting everyone have a little bit of buy-in creates a lot of investment. So I think the biggest pitfalls that you're looking for uh, to avoid is definitely, I'd really say, the conflict between players. You want everyone to sort of accept. I think by not having a preconceived notion about what the ending of the story is or a really uh, sharp structure, mm -hmm. and getting everyone to buy in that we're all going to have a little bit of narrative control and we all have choice and agency about how and when we use it yeah. is how you sort of navigate and uh, avoid that. And then if you all end up falling down the pit, the nice thing is there's excellent stories that happen at the bottom of a pit. Right. And that's how Luke killed the Rancor after all. Right, exactly. It, that is yeah. very true. <laughs> so basically, if you have a player show up with basically a Skeksis, just to <laughs> stay on that, and then someone else shows up with basically a Gelfling, <laughs> you might have to massage that situation a little bit. Um, because sure. technically, their their goals are going to be in com direct conflict with one another, right? Their goals, their personal goals might be in direct conflict with each other, but their end goal and the story goal might be, uh, be the same. We won't go too deep in Dark Crystal <laughs> lore, but they used to be joined with the mystics. No spoilers. Um, <laughs> no, they, they used to be joined, and you know, you used to have these Ursacs, and there's a reason why the Skeksis formed, and it might be that you want to portray uh, something I'll say, since you're allowed to essentially create your own fantasy race in the game, you're allowed to create your heritage and declare your own heritage, uh, you don't necessarily walk in with what I'd call the Skeksy stereotype. Uh, yeah, we need to talk spoilers later because there's a huge, <laughs> there's a huge continuity hole uh, that was developed. I'm sorry, there is. It's there. I watched, I've watched the series three times now, and we'll talk about it later. It's got a map. Uh, I have a map. <laughs> <It's> a string. <laughs> you see yarn pop up behind me on the wall. Vinci <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. I kind of want to return to the topic of like role playing mechanics, mechanics that encourage or gamify the role playing experience, and that tension between the I don't need dice to do this just talk in character or tell me what your character says and, and we'll use common sense and sort of like quick heuristics to determine what, what happens. Mm -hmm. I'm sympathetic to that view because that's kind of how I run mine. I, look at that, boom, right there. We role play and then I use like the player's say persuasion role as my reaction role, you know, using those tables in the DMG. And I prefer minimalist, uh, you know, mechanics in that regard. And I, I think I'm just interested in like, what are all the permutations and combinations and things to consider? And just, it seems like uh, adding mechanics to these kind of interactions seems to give people like pause, but at the same time, it's valuable and add something and I don't know, you know? I think it's important to discuss the type of mechanics that you add too. Because a uh, randomness mechanic of a die roll is very different than like say uh, a narrative control mechanic where I hand you a token and say, mm -hmm. this is my uh, player intrusion. I want this to be the castle where my father uh, was the uh, knight general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the different different mechanic. So I think what you want to do is mitigate the randomness, mm -hmm. and what you want to do is just give tools that people can have to use as these storytelling tools. I think a lot of it can be handled as a com as a conversation and an informal conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we've had examples at your table where. Uh, Players had very specific goals, and I had specific goals. They came into conflict with each other, and I called a timeout and talked with the player. My character would be looking for your character. Yeah. Do you want to be found? Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm still going to find you, but after you've done everything that you want to do, if it's okay with Jim. You know, and I think you just sort of have a conversation like that. A lot of this, and, and it's worth reiterating, is about comfort with the players you're playing with. It's about like comfort with the game and, and a sense of feeling empowered to stop the game and have two players have a conversation between mm -hmm. themselves. Are you good with what we're about to do? Yes, under these conditions. DM, is this all right? And like, that's the thing I see more and more of uh, as I play and the longer I, I play and I just think like, man, I wish we were doing that, <laughs> you know, 10, 15 years ago, because I think there's a, an allure of the, the, the immersion to the extent that you forget you're playing a game. We want to forget about all this stuff going on here and like live in the characters' heads. And I think that's great. 
go for it, but like taking a step back and going, no, I, I want this for my character. The example for me is like if when I play, uh, you know, warrior types, I try not to do anything that's going to pigeonhole me with a certain weapon. I want to I want to play games where I use a different weapon every time I play, or I lose all of my gear and have to, you know, currently playing a ranger and it's like I had urban herbalism kit. That was it <laughs> in walking through the forest and trying to survive. And to me, it's like. I think it touches on those uh, orthogonal play goals that you're talking about, but also like letting um, you know, letting players see what drives them, see what motivates them, and then getting out of their way. It, it seems like um, you're really trying to give people mechanics that empower the players, but the mechanics don't overpower right. the players yeah. to where you can you can play and be immersive, but you're not constantly thinking, well, I, but I need to do this so I, I can get that, advantage yeah. on blah, blah, sure, blah. Sure, sure. And you can think about it in a more naturalistic way. And, and here's, a, I think, a really good incentive. When you think about the mechanics, too, these are mechanics that uh, reveal secrets of the world to the players. So it, we'll take an example from you. You want to play a very specific warrior type. Mm -hmm. And you want to be the warrior that loses everything and only has an herbalism kit. In this type of game, you know, a game master might say, Jim, the gods are going to reveal themselves to your character if he can swear off weapons for three sessions. Mm. Well, that's a hard thing for that character to do. And you think about it, and they're, they're going to put the temptation there. They're going to create the mm -hmm. tension. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a point where your warrior is the only person that can defend the village. And there's a sword and a stone right there. There's a sword and a stone. <laughs> He'll be their king. But it might be that the gods are just testing uh, his determination to meet with them. And it might be when he meets with them that the gods give him, you know, like his trademark weapon that he becomes known for throughout all time. He becomes the object that the bards sing about. I want mechanical structures that give that kind of incentive too, where it's like, yeah. this is what the people write the stories about. You're giving the, the players the tools to form their own goals and then like, for one, I, I, I like the DM, the, the sort of the DM uh, logic of give them the moon and make them, or give them the sun and make them work for the moon. Giving them something that says, you know, you can make an impact on this world, you can find something, you can create something for your character to interface with and currently you just gotta wait for the DM to have a, a sense that yeah, this is the castle where the dad should be imprisoned. This is the village where the gods are going to test our, you know, the faith or or whatever of this, uh, you know, this woodsman. Having something where you can just sort of roll some dice or pick from a menu and follow a procedure. That's how you train DMs to be able to do this without all of that. That they, they mm -hmm. internalize it and start doing this in their own games. And it feels like um, something new and some uh, a way to take fifth edition that's different. Yeah, I think what it does is it kicks a lot of adventure back into it. When I say yeah. kicks a lot of adventure, you know, uh, it's going to breathe some fresh air. It's going to give people ideas of different uh, character avenues that maybe they haven't explored with their uh, table. Mm -hmm. It might also help them figure out maybe they want to curry their taste. Maybe they haven't had the opportunity to do an expedition style adventure where they're uh, marching across a continent. Yeah. Uh, maybe they haven't had the opportunity to have a player that's, uh, they're afraid to draw their sword and they yeah. haven't explored those emotions. Yeah. Likewise, they might not have had the opportunity to uh, defeat the villain or avenge their family and be rewarded for it. Yeah, yeah. All those things that like when we were coming up playing D&D, &D, they were in the backstories. They were things we talked about when we were just like imagining what our games would be like. Mm -hmm. But when we would sit down to play, because at least for me, I'm still following that, I was still following that old model of, no, this is my campaign. I got a story to tell. I've mm -hmm. got, I know where I want it to end and we'll kind of work our way, massage our way there. But we rarely got there. It almost always ended up with some kind of argument or, or conflict or more often than not something like that because players are frustrated that they're not getting what they want out of it. DM's frustrated because they're not invested in it. And a lot of ways, it's like if there were structures and uh, communication to go alongside it, you could have those kinds of experiences. Have your so, role play and eat it too. You certainly can. And my experience, at least with Invisible, Invisible Sun and the, the narrative control mechanics from Cypher, mm -hmm. uh, are both really encouraging uh, in that regard. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Have you joined our huge giveaway yet? We're picking the winners on October 26th. Five ways to enter, link in the comments and description. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons. The Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D.
WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. I was almost going to say we should start with uh, you and Prue talking about your feelings to each other with puppets. Oh, yes! Uh, and you're playing Jim's puppet, sock puppet, and I'm playing well, Pruitt's. Well, say it to Little Jim. <laughs> yeah. Say it to Little Jim. Say it to Little Jim. Well, like his googly eyes. Yeah. Uh, well, never fudge your dice rolls. Never fudge your dice rolls. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good Prue. Yeah. No, uh, yeah. Which, which... Well, hello, my name is Pruitt. And the things I roll came true.